Thank you, but, but uh, uh, you see, we Draculas don't drink wine. <laughs> and now let's get this one fact straight. What you see isn't always what you get. The Munsters, with all its eerie charm, hide some shattering truths. Here are the top 10 shocking things you didn't know about the TV show. I'm gonna build us a car that I'm gonna take to the drag races next Saturday, and that I personally will win back our car from this lead foot bailer by beating him at his own game. Number 10, the origins of the Dragula. Hey, remember the ghoul on wheels that made its grand appearance in the episode Hot Rod Herman, where Grandpa Munster builds the car to race against a local dragster? Yep, I'm talking about the Dragula car the macabre masterpiece that became an instant hit among fans of the Munsters films, despite only having a minor role. Designed by the brilliant project engineer George Barris, the Dragula captured imaginations with its eerie charm, and don't even get me started on its unconventional design. Thanks to its ghoulish appearance, this car left an unmistakable mark on pop culture, inspiring various recreations over the years. Even rock musician Rob Zombie paid homage to Grandpa Munster's spooky ride with a song titled Dragula. Oh, you knew that already. All right, fine. Well, did you know that, as amazing and surreal as the car looks? What makes the Dragula even more intriguing is its origin story, a tale steeped in legal hurdles and creative problem solving. Filmed in North Hollywood, the production faced a peculiar challenge. You see, at the time of the filming, purchasing a coffin without a death certificate was strictly forbidden, and this regulation posed a significant obstacle, as the show's creators wanted an authentic coffin to construct the car. In fact, for George Barris, a whiz known for his innovative car designs, a real coffin was crucial. It was either that or nothing, and he wasn't going to take no for an answer. Wondering what he did next? Under cover of night, Barris struck a clandestine deal with a local funeral director, exchanging cash for a casket, which was discreetly picked up from the funeral home's back door. This daring maneuver allowed Barris and his team to bring the Dragula to life, adding an authentic touch to the show's spooky aesthetics. If you really think about it, it's easy to see why Barris was so insistent. The Dragula's design, featuring a coffin body, organ pipes, and a tombstone grill perfectly matched the Munster family's ghoulish yet lovable image. We wouldn't dare to make this list without talking about it. So next time you think of the Munsters, do well to remember the Dragula, a car born out of spooky deals and quirky genius, embodying the essence of the show's dark humor and innovative spirit. Number 9. Beverly Owen Hated Every Second of the Munsters Rising through the ranks for her portrayal of Marilyn Munster, the sweet and kind-hearted niece in the peculiar Munster family, it didn't take long for Beverly Owens to become a fan favorite, endearing audiences with her warmth and genuine presence. However, if there's one thing to know about Hollywood, it has to be the fact that there's always more than meets the eye. Behind the scenes, Owens' experience was anything but smooth. From the very beginning, Owen faced a significant struggle. She was deeply homesick, not just for the family comforts of home, but for her fiancé, who was living in New York. The distance between them was immense, and as filming continued in California, the separation took a heavy toll on her emotional well-being, and it only got worse. As the series progressed, each passing day on set was a reminder of the miles between her and her fiancé. Voicing her desire to leave wasn't easy and talent agent Monique James threatened legal action if Owen broke her contract. This added a layer of distress, making her feel trapped in a situation she desperately wanted to escape. Can you believe it? The role that brought her fame was also the source of her greatest anguish. The emotional toll became so severe that Owen often left the set in tears. After painstakingly enduring 13 episodes, Owen finally managed to break free from her contract. This move was a significant relief, allowing her to return to New York and reunite with her lover. This set the ball rolling for Pat Priest, whose seamless transition ensured that the character continued to thrive. Some may say the latter was basically born for the show. But now that you know the touching story of Beverly Owen, let's dive into another intriguing aspect of the Munsters, the behind-the-scenes magic that made Pat Priest's transition into the role so seamless. Number 8. The Shocking Truth Behind Pat Priest's Role I don't know about you, but transitioning from one actor to another can be a delicate process for any TV show especially one as big as the Munsters. For Beverly Owen, playing Marilyn Munster was a bore. She couldn't wait to leave the role and reunite with her lover back east. However, when Owen left the show, her departure opened the door for Pat Priest, who stepped into the role as if she were destined for it. In any case, the latter's entry into the Munster was nothing short of bizarre, but in a good way. 
Imagine a Hollywood bigwig was ready to leave the show, and a replacement who not only matched her physically, but brought her own unique flair to the role was just hanging around the corner. Priest, the daughter of United States Treasurer Ivy Baker Priest, was more than just a convenient substitute. She was the perfect fit, sharing the same blonde hair and statue as Owen. It wasn't just luck, it was a casting miracle. Just think about it for a second. The transition could have been a disaster. How many times have we seen beloved characters replaced, only to have the show suffer for it? It's happened a gazillion times, but thankfully not this time. Pat Priest's resemblance to Owen meant she could slip into the Marilyn outfits without any costly adjustments. This was a huge win for the production team, saving both time and money. More importantly, it meant the audience barely noticed the change, maintaining the show's continuity and charm. Plus, Priest brought her own brand of charisma to Marilyn Munster. Her portrayal added a fresh dynamic to the character, ensuring she wasn't just a carbon copy of her predecessor. In all, the producer's choice to cast Priest turned out to be a masterstroke, preserving all the essence of Marilyn while allowing Priest to shine in her own light. I guess it's true after all, sometimes fate has a sense of humor. As we drive down memory lane to explore more shocking behind-the-scenes secrets of one of the most iconic TV shows of its era, you might want to fasten your seatbelt as I'm about to dive into yet another fascinating aspect of the Munsters that will leave you even more intrigued. That's what I call flair. <laughs> Number 7. Munster Matriarch? Ah yes, Lily Munster the eerie yet endearing matriarch of the Munster household. Who could ever forget her? With her strikingly pale complexion, flowing dark hair, and timeless gothic attire, Lily Munster embodies a perfect blend of spooky elegance and maternal warmth. Played by Yvonne DiCarlo, Lily's character brought a unique charm to the show, balancing her eerie appearance with a nurturing and loving nature that resonates with viewers. Her ability to be both a devoted wife to Herman Munster and a doting mother to Eddie and to navigate the ordinary challenges of family life while living in a haunted mansion with Frankenstein's monster, a vampire, and a werewolf also added depth and relatability to the otherwise outlandish Munster family. She was something viewers couldn't get enough of, but here's a shocking twist. Did you know that Lily Munster almost never existed? It may sound inconceivable, but yeah, it's true. Before Yvonne DiCarlo donned the dark wig and heavy makeup, the Munster matriarch was a different character entirely. In the original plot, Herman Munster's wife was named Phoebe, played by Joan Marshall. This initial version of the character was quite similar in appearance to Morticia Adams from the Adams family, which posed a significant problem. Many believed the resemblance was too uncanny, and the producers decided that changes were necessary to avoid direct comparisons between the two shows. In a surprising turn of events, Joan Marshall was replaced, and Yvonne DiCarlo was brought in to redefine the character. The shift from Phoebe to Lily Munster was not just a casting change, but a complete character overhaul. Make no mistake, the decision was a game changer. DiCarlo, already a Hollywood star, brought a different energy and depth to the role, making Lily Munster an unforgettable character. But alas, her introduction to the cast was far from seamless. You see, DiCarlo faced initial skepticism from her co-stars, Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis, who both doubted her ability to blend into the quirky family dynamic of the Munsters. And it didn't help either that DiCarlo's meticulous attention to her hair and makeup often caused delays on set, testing the patience of the crew. Yet in spite of these early hurdles, Yvonne DiCarlo's professionalism and comedic talent eventually won over her co-stars. Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis came to appreciate her dedication and skill, which helped solidify the strong on-screen chemistry that the Munsters is now known for. Her character, Lily, became the heart of the show, providing a comforting and stabilizing presence amidst the comedic chaos. Number 6. The Munster of Frankenstein Love it or hate it, in the annals of film history, few sets have achieved the iconic status of Dr. Frankenstein's lab from the 1931 classic Frankenstein. The laboratory, brimming with electrifying gadgets, mysterious bubbling beakers, and a palpable sense of foreboding, was more than just a backdrop. It became a blueprint for the archetypical mad scientist's workshop, setting a precedent for horror films and influencing countless other niches and TV shows for generations, including the Munsters. But hey, you know what they say, there's always a brain behind every marvel. This time, Kenneth Strickfaden was a brilliant special effects artist whose work on Frankenstein brought an unprecedented level of realism and terror to the scene. His innovative use of electrical effects and meticulous attention to detail created a visually stunning and hauntingly immersive environment that significantly contributed to the film's lasting legacy. 
But guess what? His work didn't end there. Fast forward to the 1960s, and Strick Fadden's exceptional skills were once again required in another groundbreaking project, the television series The Munsters, this time for the character Grandpa Munster. What's fascinating is that many of the props and gadgets that adorned Grandpa Munster's lab were strikingly similar to those used in Dr. Frankenstein's lab. I would bet you'd never noticed it. This deliberate continuity wasn't just a clever nod to horror cinema's past, but also to a way to infuse the Munsters with a sense of authenticity and respect for its horror roots. Plus, mimicking designs effectively bridged the gap between the eerie terror of Frankenstein and the light-hearted macabre humor of the Munsters ensuring that Grandpa's lab became as memorable on the small screen as Dr. Frankenstein's lab was on the big screen. Surprised by how something seemingly inconsequential can cast a large shadow when everything's said and done? Keep watching, because the next facts I'll be telling you about will blow your minds. Well, Grandpa, why don't you give me the cold shoulder like the rest of my loyal family? Because <laughs> I happen to have the solution to this whole dilemma. <laughs> Number 5. One Big Coincidence Face it guys, ever since the debut of The Munsters and The Addams Family, both shows have been locked in a perpetual comparison game that still exists to this very day. And it's pretty easy to see why people draw parallels between these two iconic TV shows. Both shows explore themes of acceptance and the beauty of diversity, albeit through the lens of humor and satire, and also features families who delight in the macabre and the unconventional, yet are endearingly close-knit and loving. In the Munsters, you have Herman, Lily, Grandpa, Eddie, and the normal cousin Marilyn living in a haunted mansion, with storylines often parodying horror tropes. On the other hand, the Adams Family features Gomez, Morticia, Wednesday, Pugsley, Uncle Fester, and Lurch in a gothic mansion, with their adventures steeped in dark humor. The question of who's more successful and enduring is debatable, but the visual aesthetics of both series also invite comparisons. Remember when I told you Lily Munster's persona almost never existed because of the physical similarities with Morticia Adams from the Adams Family? It got so heated that the procedures had to make tweaks to avoid direct comparisons between the two shows, like that even helped. You see, while the Adams Family debuted on ABC, CBS's The Munsters made its debut in the same year, and in fact only a week apart, prompting jeers and whispers of foul play. But here's the twist. The rumors of one studio copying the other are largely overblown. While the thematic similarities are striking, the development of these shows was more coincidental than you might think. Walk with me here. The Munsters was conceived as a parody of Universal Studios' classic monster movies, and its pre-production phase actually began before The Addams Family. CBS envisioned a sitcom featuring a spooky yet comical family, and this idea was being fleshed out independently of any knowledge of what ABC was planning. Meanwhile, ABC was eager to bring Charles Adams' delightfully macabre cartoons to life, thus giving birth to the Adams Family TV show. The simultaneous release dates? Well, that's a different story. ABC hurried to fast-track the Adams Family to ensure they wouldn't be left in the dust by CBS's The Munsters. They didn't want CBS to monopolize this quirky niche, so they pushed to get their show out quickly. So you see, while The Munsters and The Addams Family might seem like rivals born from a copycat movie, the truth is that they are two independently developed shows that happen to tap into the same cultural zeitgeist. The Aftermath, a shared legacy to television history that continues to captivate audiences with its unique blend of humor, horror, and never-ending comparisons. Here's another hot tea, and I'm absolutely certain you never saw this one coming. Number 4. Wardrobe Disaster Let's be real for a second. When you think of the Munsters, what's the first name that comes to mind? Herman Munster, right? Of course he is. The towering, endearing patriarch with a heart as big as his imposing frame is unforgettable, and so was his actor, Fred Gwynn, whose portrayal combined a commanding physical presence with a warm, bumbling charm that endeared him to audiences. However, what many might not realize is that, behind that lovable monster mask, Gwynn faced considerable hardships during production. To start with, Gwynn's iconic Frankenstein costume, for all of its charm and appeal as a visual spectacle, was far from comfortable. He had to navigate the whole set wearing boots with 4-inch soles designed to enhance his imposing stature. And make no mistake, those weren't your typical walking shoes. They were heavy, heavy, bodacious, asphalt-paving boots that made every step anything but a walk in the park. What are these? I've been asked to come out here and, uh, entertain you. And guess what? The costume challenges didn't end there. To create Herman's formidable build, 
Gwen wore several pounds of foam padding, all while studio lights turned the set into a sweltering furnace. The heat was relentless, and Gwen ended up shedding 10 pounds during the first season alone from excessive sweating. Yikes! To combat the intense heat, the crew rigged up an air compressor to blow cold air into Gwen's costume between takes. This impromptu cooling system provided some relief, but it couldn't completely alleviate the discomfort. Despite occasional lemonade breaks to stay hydrated, Gwen struggled with back pain due to the weight and the strain of the costume. So next time you watch The Munsters and see Herman's charming antics, just remember the extreme lengths Fred Gwynn went to in bringing this beloved character to life. For anything, I admire his dedication. Not a lot of actors would have been resilient enough to endure such intense conditions. For that, Gwynn truly deserves recognition. And speaking of recognition, if you're still with us, chances are you're thoroughly enjoying our exploration of the most shocking truths about The Munsters TV show. So why don't you hit the subscribe button and turn on post notifications so you'll be in the loop whenever we release a new video. It'll only take you a second. Already subscribed? Great, let's move on to truth number three. Number three, the Munster's original pitch was stolen. The creative industry, especially Tinseltown, is often a wild jungle. Ideas can be borrowed, adapted, and sometimes outright stolen. Such was the case of Alan Burns and Chris Hayward, whose creative work and contributions to the Munsters were almost snatched right underneath their noses. You see, television was rapidly evolving in the 1960s. The airwaves were beginning to embrace offbeat and supernatural themes, sparked by the success of shows like Bewitched, I Dream of Genie, and My Favorite Martian. Fans and audiences were growing fond of witches, genies, aliens, and all sorts of unusual characters, reflecting a shift towards uh, unconventional storytelling. During this transformative era, Alan Burns and Chris Hayward, known for their work on cartoons like The Rocky and Bullwinkle Show, conceived a fresh idea a quirky family sitcom inspired by the darkly humorous cartoons of Charles Adams. Their pitch to Universal Studios focused on a family of weirdos, capturing the same macabre charm that made Adams' creation so beloved. However, what would have been a straightforward presentation took a darker turn when their contact at Universal passed on their pitch without crediting them, a significant blow to the original thought boxes. If it weren't for the invention of the Writers Guild of America, the duo may have never received the recognition they deserved. Despite the initial setback, however, Alan Burns went on to achieve great success in television. He co-created iconic shows like The Mary Tyler Moore Show and Rhoda, which became staples of American TV comedy and showcased his remarkable talent. Chris Hayward was no slouch either. He left his mark on television, contributing to beloved series such as Get Smart and Barney Miller. So you see, the legacy of the Munsters is more than just the quirky and endearing family it portrayed. It rode on the backs of amazing creative minds who, despite setbacks, fought for their rights and cemented their places in Hollywood. Number 2. The Munsters – To Color or Not To Color This one's for the Millennials and Gen Z. Back in the 60s, as Color TV was starting to gain traction, CBS faced a significant decision. Should they film the Munsters in color or stick with the classic black and white? Although color TV had been around since the 1950s, it was still a luxury for many households due to its high cost. It was a pretty big dilemma. Color would have added a richer layer, but CBS decided to play it safe and opt for black and white. Why, you may ask? Well, there are several theories. While some suggest it was a cost-saving measure, others believe CBS thought black and white would make the show less frightening for younger viewers. Another idea is that the network wanted to maintain the spooky tone of the classic Universal Monsters movies that inspired the series. Regardless of the reasons, this decision might have played a role in the show's eventual decline. While black and white undoubtedly added to the Munster's eerie atmosphere, it also limited its appeal, especially as color TV sets became more popular. By 1966, when ABC launched its colorful and dynamic Batman series, the Munsters struggled to compete. Batman's vibrant visuals and high-energy appeal drew viewers away from the monochrome world of the Munsters, leading to declining ratings and the show's cancellation after just two seasons. It's intriguing to ponder what might have happened if the Munsters had been filmed in color from the start. Would the show have attracted a larger audience and enjoyed a longer run? It's one of those tantalizing what-ifs that leaves us wondering about alternate TV history. But before we go into the final pick of the day, did you know that the unaired pilot episode, My Fair Munster, was actually filmed in color? The decision to stick with black and white for the series was made after a few test screenings. It's kind of weird, don't you think? It's been so long that I can't even imagine how black and white movies were so enthralling. Color is just so much better nowadays. Uh, you can be black or yellow or white. It doesn't matter. But what does matter 
is the size of your heart and the strength of your character. But what do you think? Would the monsters have had a different end if it was actually filmed in color? Or perhaps its decline was inevitable? It's a decision that remains unanswered, but I'd like to get your thoughts in the comments. While you're at it, here's another bombshell. Number 1. An Animated Monsterverse Following our reflection on how Color TV might have changed the fate of the monsters, let's talk about how another intriguing what-if scenario could have potentially altered television history. Few fans know this, but back in the 1940s, the monsters almost took an entirely different form. During the decade, Universal Studios was at the peak of its monster movie era, producing timeless classics like The Invisible Man Returns, The Wolfman, and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. And it was during this monster mania that Bob Clampett, the creative genius behind beloved Looney Tunes characters like Porky Pig and Daffy Duck, pitched a unique idea to Universal, a family of funny monsters. After moving on from Warner Brothers cartoons to television, Mr. Clampett made a name for himself with creator-driven series like Time for Beanie and Beanie and Cecil. His vision for a show featuring a comedy family of monsters was pitched during the height of Universal's monster movie success. This idea sparked a heated debate among Universal executives. Should our new show be animated or live action? Animation proponents argued for the imaginative appeal and limitless possibilities of cartoons, while others believed that live action would offer realism and charm that animation could not. In the end, the decision was made to go with live action, giving the show its distinctive charm and allowing the actors to bring these iconic characters to life in a way that deeply resonated with viewers. Yet one can't help but wonder what might have been. Imagine an alternative world where the Munsters debuted as an animated series during Universal's monster movie Heyday. An animated monster family could have capitalized on the studio's existing monster craze, blending humor with its eerie aesthetic that was already popular. But hey, it's difficult to say. An animated version of the Munsters might have struggled to find its footing during the 1960s, as television audiences were just beginning to embrace live-action sitcoms with fantastical elements. While animated offered creative freedom, it often faced stigma as being just for kids, potentially limiting its appeal to a broader audience. Additionally, the unique charm of the actors, especially Fred Gwynn as Herman Munster, would have been lost in translation. The live-action format allowed for physical comedy and nuanced performances that endeared the characters to viewers, a quality that might not have been translated as effectively in animated form. That wraps up our journey through 10 of the most astonishing things most people don't know about the Munsters TV show. Whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer, we're sure these revelations have given you a lot to think about. So if you enjoyed these stories as much as we did, hit the like button and keep the conversation going by sharing which revelation surprised you the most in the comments. But don't leave just yet, there's so much more to uncover. Check out the video currently displaying on your screen for another jaw-dropping insight into Hollywood's best hidden secrets.